All right, guys, we are here at the Space Symposium in Colorado Springs, and we have some amazing interviews lined up for you already. We have Sierra Space ready to go. We've also got Lockheed Martin going to be talking about nuclear propulsion with them. So on top of that, we also have Airbus and their new involvement with a brand new space station, the Star Lab, that I've talked about many times on this channel. Channel. But now we get to hear all of the exciting details from Airbus themselves. All of this combined with amazing scenes like this RL-10 engine here from Aerojet Rocketdyne, which is one of the longest lived and most established engines in the history of space flight. Let me tell you something, in these series of videos, you're going to get some content unlike anything you've seen before. Can't wait to bring it to you, so let's get going. Would you be so kind as to introduce yourself to the viewers? Okay, of course. So my name is Manfred Jaumann. I'm working since more than 30 years uh, uh, for, for Airbus in uh, space business. Um, I started after my military uh, professional life uh, in the German Armed Forces uh, in, uh, at Donier, at the Lake of Constance, uh, and then stayed uh, all the time uh, to that what is named currently an uh, Airbus. And uh, so I did always a uh, human space flight and um, uh, I'm currently responsible for in, in the space exploration area of space in Airbus, which is human space flight. Right. Um, and I'm responsible for that what we call Earth. So we are organized in that area in Earth, Moon, Mars and I'm Earth. So, and uh, this is International Space Station. These right. are the, all the scientific and also industrial payloads, meanwhile, the life support systems, then also derivates out of the life support system for terrestrial applications like submarines, military submarines. Right. Yeah. And, uh, and, and also the operations and the utilization uh, of, the interne of the European part of the International Space Station, the sounding rockets program, blah, 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 and so, so on. Sounds like you've had a lot of, of uh, yeah, experience yes, yeah. that you've done. Tell me something real quick. Um, in regards to Star Lab, this is, of course, what the viewers are really interested yeah, in. Sure. How, is it that, um, how is it that Airbus became involved in this project? because you weren't one of the original partners with, uh, with NanoRex and Voyager and all that. Uh, how did Airbus become involved and why did you become involved? Yeah, very simple. Uh, some two years ago, uh, we started uh, to look into that what will happen after the ISS. We knew it will be uh, decommissioned sometime 2030 and uh, we knew if we want to do something after that, we have to start now. Uh, because this takes years. It's, it's not an iron or a toaster, <laughs> it's, a, it's a space station. Right. And uh, then we looked in Europe and there was no substantial program uh, visible. Uh, I always say a little bit it was dark and cold. <laughs> yes. And so we turned our heads towards US and looked what's happening there. And you see it was bright, it's shining. Uh, NASA on the behalf of the US government uh, started a commercial program called CDFF. Uh, the Commercial Destination Free Flyer Program, and then we approached the players there, um, uh, did some exchanges, and uh, to make it very short, then uh, the best fit was then uh, with our concept and Nanorex, which is now Voyager. Right. And uh, so uh, this was the, the, the birth here in Colorado Springs two years ago. Uh, there was a panel for commercial space stations, future space stations, and all was US American. And there was allowed one European guy, and that was me. <laughs> <laughs> well, and so, you're a great addition. Yeah, obviously. and so I took the, or, or we took the opportunity to introduce a concept, but, which was a response to an ESA request uh, for, uh, for uh, to reach out to the uh, European industry to 
tell ESA, the European Space Agency, their ideas what could be after the ISS. And so we had a very mature concept with a core element. It's a habitation module, right. eight meters diameter, three floors high, yes. eight to ten meters, and metallic structure. Yes. And this was the concept. Right. And we approached the US guys with this concept uh, in telling them this is not a super lightweight aluminium structure like it is on the ISS. Right. We will not produce it in a clean room. We will go to a shipyard. It is wow. out of stainless steel. It is yes. super heavy. Yes. <laughs> and why are we doing that? Because we can. Right. Because we will have a new generation of super heavy launchers like the Starship. Right. At that time, we had already a pre-contract with them. That's fantastic. So you, you had these plans made a long time ago. When I interviewed Nanorax in, uh, in Paris in 2022, at that time, or at least publicly, they weren't willing to say whether they were going to go inflatable or with the type of it's module true. like yours. So can you tell me, what is it about your module that works so much better than an inflatable module in orbit? Yeah, so uh, the inflatable um, modules are because of the launchers. And uh, so uh, we, said, uh, we, we see at the horizon new launches and we are very confident that these launches at the time we want or we have to launch, they will be ready and operational. This, this is the, the discriminator and this is a game changer right. uh, because the inflatables, you cannot do anything with inflatables. They are good, they are good one, but not for all purposes. If you do want to, 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 to live in, a, in such a module, to work in such a module, to do research and development in such a module and to make it effective and cost effective for all, all above, then a metallic structure is much, much better. Uh, why? Yeah. Because first, you have, if you do it out of stainless steel, you have almost no radiation inside. Yeah. Good this point. is a big advantage. Right. The next one is if the diameter is big enough, you can do things that are, for example, on the ISS, outside the station, where you have to do EVAs, extravehicular activities with astronauts going out of the spacecraft, mm -hmm. highest risk exposure. Right. You stop all the operations of the, of, the, of the station in the flight segment, in the ground segment. You stop to, to do work right. only for that purpose. And they, they, this is really risky. And we avoid that because we can do a lot of things that are outside of ISS inside this module because the diameter is so big. Right. And so this, these are advantages that others don't have. Yeah, definitely. Now on the lower level you have, it rotates, right, and provides a little bit of artificial mm -hmm. gravity. Tell mm -hmm. me about that feature. Yeah, yeah this, is, uh, this module is not the Starlab. This module is named Airbus Loop. And, right. uh, and it is a multi-purpose, versatile uh, module. You can do low Earth orbit um, um, application with that. You can but also do um, long-term missions, long-distance missions up to Mars. Right. And uh, Starlab is so to say our first customer yeah? right. with this main module right. in their okay. station sure. because okay. they replaced it. Uh, uh, it was beforehand from Lockheed right. and inflatable. And so they chose this one. But we can also do other things. And if you go for long distance or long duration uh, in space, you have uh, to take care of the health of the astronauts, of the crew, and therefore the centrifuge. It's only an illustration what we could do. Right. For low Earth orbit, we don't do that. Okay. We use this floor uh, for storage, storage, uh, and other systems that we need. All right. Yeah. How, how do you anticipate, or I don't know if the solid decisions have been made for Starlab, how will this module be arranged? Do you know yet? Like, what is, what's floor one, floor two, et cetera, going to be used for? One floor is, of course, is, is uh, for sure hab uh, uh, habitation. Right. Uh, much more comfortable than in the ISS. Mm -hmm. Each crew member will have its uh, own cabin. Wow. Private, private uh, is, is, is important. Yeah. Uh, we have as a strategic partner also Hilton uh, on board. Yes, they uh, will yeah. take care and make it more convenient than we had in, 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 uh, have it in the, in the ISS. This is habitation right. with everything you need. Uh, the second floor is um, of, for sure work, doing research and oh. the, uh, development uh, things. And most probably the third also, with a mixed mode of storage, storage and all what you need. Right. Yeah. Then we have, in addition to the habitat, a combined service module with an additional module that's integrated uh, and then uh, attached to this habitat uh, for guidance, navigation, control, supply of everything and power and blah, 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 but also to, to uh, host things that we don't want to have in the habitat. 
uh, like a toilet right. or other things right. because this is not good on the ISS, I right. can tell you. And so we keep it a little bit away and separate it and make it much more comfortable to work and to live in the habitat. Fascinating. The, um, so SpaceX fans are going to want to know, because, I mean, you've been designing this module for quite some time. Since it's eight meters in diameter, really the only rocket, I mean, even New Glenn isn't big enough to handle it. So the only rocket that really can carry it that we know about anyway is Starship. What made you so confident that Starship was going to work, you know, since you started on this project way before Starship even flew for the first time? Yeah, uh, so uh, maybe it sounds a little bit strange, but uh, we looked uh, on SpaceX since long time uh, and I'm also familiar with launcher business and so look at what they did with Falcon 1, no, no one believed it, mm-hmm. uh, then uh, Falcon 9, no one believed it right, right. And, and so on. So we are very confident and, but in addition to that, look 100 years or 80 years or 50 years back. What did the pioneers of space? They tried and failed. Mm-hmm. And then tried again and failed. And tried again and failed. Hundreds of times. In right. the aerospace industry, 100 years ago. And in the aeronautics, it was in Germany, former times, until the system flew. Because you learn if you fail. Right. And this is the approach of SpaceX. And therefore, I'm super confident all the time it, it will fly. And the, the, the last test flight, the third one, was a super success. Yes. If, uh, all, all above for, Star, for Starlab, it's sufficient. Because yes. they had a failure in the re-entry, but we don't right. need the re-entry. No, we we only want to <laughs> board up. Exactly. So they, they, exactly. It will go. And uh, they will soon launch a, a starships every month. Yes. You know that? Yes. I do. And so we launch in 28, late 28, it's tomorrow, or, uh, or beginning of 29, and it will work. That is so exciting. I, I, I can't imagine. So tell me, I mean, Airbus obviously, you know, is, 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 a, is a huge institution in, in aerospace. I mean, when you compare it to some of the newer players in the market, you know, Airbus is, is more of the generation of things that happened before, and yet you're trying to behave more like one of these newer companies, one of these more innovative companies. Mm-hmm. Can you tell me about the culture at Airbus that makes that happen? How is it that you guys are doing this and many other companies might not? Yeah, so um, first of all, uh, we have very often uh, the slogan, there's old space and new space. I don't believe in that. Uh, there's space. Right. It is okay. human spaceflight. And all we, we are doing, the startups, the small and medium-sized enterprises, the large system integrators are doing space business. And uh, we have a management, and I'm, I'm super glad to have that, up to the CEO of Airbus, who are recognizing that. We have to face the development of the market. And this is exploding, uh, even within space industry, but also non-space industry, the, uh, uh, recognizing that space is, a, is an opportunity for them. Right. And so it's, it's, it's exploding. And uh, so we, we have to leave the pioneer, the pioneer phase. It's over. And uh, we have to industrialize. And this happens now in low Earth orbit for the first time. And others will follow. Moon, this, this will follow. And so our management on all levels recognizes that and is backing that. And so in fact, within this big, big, big beast of Airbus, yeah, is we, we started we are allowed to be a startup. Uh-huh. We are working differently. And meanwhile, others, other projects, other programs at the sites where we work, because we work differently, right. they learn, they start to copy. Oh, okay. And this is really good. It's a dynamic within the company. Indeed. And others, why, why are they doing that? I don't know. Hey, it's, uh, it's very exciting. We motivate them. Follow us. Right. Join us. Absolutely. It's time. Let's hope they do. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, Europe is changing, obviously. I, I moved to Europe specifically to cover what's happening in European space flight. You have Rocket Factory Augsburg, for example, who are about to launch hopefully the first orbital mission, you know, vertical orbital mission anyway from Western Europe. Um, they're working on something called the Argo, which I'm sure you're familiar with. Europe is all of a sudden starting to get engaged in not only um, space flight involving unmanned and, and resupply, that sort of thing, but now possibly human space flight as you are. What do you think has caused that change? And do you think this is a real change? Because a lot of European viewers, they deal, they look at this with skepticism. They said there have been many starts and stops in Europe for human space flight, and it always stops. Mm-hmm. Do you think that this is different this time? And if so, why? 
Yeah, in Europe we have a development that started in the US uh, since a few years already. Uh, we are a little bit late, but not too late. So in Europe we have the, the, we have the development that uh, not like in former uh, years um, or decades, it is not the number one of priority anymore. We have a lot of issues, a lot of problems to be solved on macroeconomic level. So this is one of 20 important topics. And uh, this is the first thing. The second thing is that we have a lot of young people uh, that want to do, that they want to do something and they take initiative. And this is the startup scenery that we have. And out of that we see that uh, especially the, the launcher uh, area, but also the, 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 the transport area with cargo and crew transport and resupply of destinations like, like space stations. Right. All that is a little bit suffering and now come the, the, the young people are coming and, and doing that. This was not the case in former times, but right. it is now happening. And uh, this is that what we want. We want because they need someone the big ones, the big players, the, the big guys, uh -huh. to do the, the big stuff, right. the, 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 a, a, a space station. Right. And then we take them with us and they do the outfitting, they do the payloads, they do all that. And what we have to create is an ecosystem. And this ecosystem consists out of places to be, transport systems and ground segments where young people and uh, small and medium-sized enterprises, startups and others, academia, industry, can do their research and uh, secure uh, this high-tech uh, workforce in the regions and create perspective for the future. And Starlab contributes to that uh, because the operation space of this space station is three decades. It starts in 2029 and it is until 2059. Imagine that. Yeah. And so this, kind of hard to believe. this is for all responsible guys in, 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 in politics or whatever. This is a, pers this is a perspective, this is sustainability. Right. And so they are ready to invest in that. And this motivates young people to do it. And this, this is it's stimulating the market. Manfred, I could talk to you all day about this, but unfortunately we have run out of time. Yeah. I really appreciate your time, mm -hmm. though. It's just a fantastic opportunity. And uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank Take you care. for your time. All right, folks. Quite an amazing interview there. A lot of new stuff developing, and we're getting the bleeding edge of it here at the Space Symposium. Got more to bring you, so really exciting stuff still coming. Stay tuned for the next episode. In the meantime, stay angry about space.